Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to series four of the Climate Pioneers show. This is a show where we speak to the innovators, the change makers, and the enablers that are driving forward the climate industry. Each of our previous series have had a different focus. In series one, we featured the stories of early stage startup founders in the UK. Series two featured the insights and advice of climate tech investors. And series three featured the stories of female climate tech founders and their thoughts on the gender funding gap. But now we are back with three episodes in to series four, uh, where we are going to be featuring the stories of climate tech innovators on the east coast of the US. We're going to learn about the important work that they're doing to combat the climate crisis and dig into what inspired them to take action in the first place. We'll learn about the challenges they faced in those first few years of business. But most importantly, we're going to get their top tips on the communities and organizations that have helped them along the way, the books and podcasts that they recommend, and the productivity hacks that they use to manage their workload. So let's get stuck in. This week, I am delighted to be joined by Elizabeth Landau, COO and co-founder of Green Portfolio. Founded in 2020 with her co-founder, Bonnie, Green Portfolio helps consumers to understand the impact of their financial investments and make better informed decisions about how to reduce the environmental impact of their money. Before launching Green Portfolio, Elizabeth had built a career in product marketing and strategy for consumer packaged goods, latterly running brand and marketing for an electronic consumer goods business. So she has got a keen understanding of what drives consumer behavior and how to position and market a brand effectively. So very much looking forward to her insights on that. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. My pleasure. So as always, I, I've sort of given an intro there as to Green Portfolio and what you do, but can you elaborate a little bit for, for our listeners on what problem space you're in? Why is it such an impactful problem that you're solving? Sure, sure. So, you know, Green Portfolio, we're really laser focused on bringing transparency and awareness to us as individuals in terms of what our money is doing, right? When it sits at the bank or how we invest. Your money's never sitting idly by. It's always doing something, but you just don't see it. So understanding you know, the impact that you can have in tackling climate change with your hard earned dollars is really important. Um, a lot of actual information has come out actually from the UK in terms of you know, shifting you know, a pension fund to sustainable funds. Uh, it's typically 20, at least 20 times more impactful uh, doing something like that, then, you know, showering less or shorter showers, flying less, um, becoming vegan, all of those things are very important. Um, but it, it requires a lot on you as an individual to make that change. Like, I, I really think the onus should be on the corporations and the governments in terms of us as individuals putting pressure on those organizations to make sure that they're really driving emissions reduction and focusing on climate solutions. And we can do that with our money. Yeah. So what Green Portfolio does is allows you to, you know, sync up your investment account or your bank account. We instantly score that for you in terms of climate impact. So you get your own personal Green Portfolio score. And then we show you ways that you can manage and mitigate uh, the emissions from your portfolio and show you suggestions for greener alternatives if you don't like what you see. Amazing. And, and you know, as you said there at the very beginning, your money's always doing something. And I think that's something that we we don't realise. I think a lot of people think they put their money in their bank and it sort of sits in, like in, in Gringotts, like in Harry Potter. It's just in a vault somewhere, just sitting there. A giant, a giant piggy bank somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. And I think that we, we're kind of naive to the impact that our money's having. I mean, if you, do, to, to put that into perspective for people listening who perhaps don't know about this concept have you can you kind of contextualize what that money's doing and 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 what level of impact that's having sure carbon emissions sure. sure the the easiest i think example probably is looking at at banking yeah. so you have you know a savings account um you put your hard-earned dollars into that savings account as you're working you know probably monthly bi-weekly uh what's happening is the bank uses your money um for loans, 
right? The loans can be used for, you know, you know, wind projects, like for wind farms, or it could be used for, you know, oil extraction. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there's a lot of information out there now. Uh, Rainforest Action Network is actually a really great organization that publishes, you know, an annual report around where the money is flowing in terms of fossil fuel financing from, you know, the, the top 60, the largest banks uh, globally. And trillions of dollars are being funneled into the fossil fuel exploration. JP Morgan, uh, I think, is one of is the worst in terms they have the they have the, the winning the winning ticket there in terms of the most funding uh, over the past uh, six years. Um, so they've been tracking this since the Paris Agreement was was formed. Uh, so your money, you know, could be off um, being used to drill oil or natural gas. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you are reading into the, all these reports and disclosures yourself. Yeah. So that's kind of where we come in is we look at all of that and do all the research for you and are able to sum that up into like a zero to 100 score for a bank or for an ETF, you know, a fund, for example, um, and show you where the exposure is. Because we know that it it can be overwhelming to look at all of this information and very time consuming. Um, talking about two very um, heavy, large, large things to tackle, right? Finance and climate change. And so if we at Green Portfolio can help you, uh, you know, lift some of that burden off of you to make it easier for you to make changes or take action, that's what we want to do. And how quick a process is that in terms of sort of assessing what somebody's current impact is and then helping them make a switch to something greener? I mean, the assessment part for us, minutes. So in terms of what you as an individual would do, you go to greenportfolio.com, you create a free account, um, you sync up using an aggregator. Um, you know, We don't hold your account information. So that's done by a secure third party. Uh, you, let's say you're at you know, insert bank here or insert you know, institution here for investing purposes. Um, we pull, it magically pulls in your balances, the funds you have, and then we score that all on the back end. So you go to your climate hub and you'll see your score along with, you know, your exposure to fossil fuels, your um, percentage of your portfolio that is getting their energy sourcing needs from renewables versus, you know, um, you know from a clean energy source. So it is minutes in terms of figuring out what you might want to do in terms of you know, changing you know, maybe what funds you're in, that can take a little bit longer. Um, that's really up to you as an individual. Uh, we're here to give you the information you need to do that. We are not here to be your financial advisor or, you know, trade on your behalf. Um, but we do give you up to six greener alternatives for a fund, you know, in a similar sector, uh, if it's something that you want to explore. Amazing. And actually switching a bank account is so much easier than I think people realize it is. And switching a pension is so much easier. And to your point, it's so impactful. And you've got people out there, I would imagine many, many people out there who are trying to eat better, who are recycling, who are using the car less and, and actually brilliant and, and keep doing all those things. All those things are incredibly important, but they're also banking with Chase Bank or Barclays over here. And actually they've got thousands of pounds directly investing in the things that over here they're trying to mitigate through their actions. And, and I think it's a, so much more impactful and B, so much quicker and easier to actually make the change than people realize. It's just about your tools like yours that help people see the truth and understand what, what their money is financing. So, yeah, amazing. And, and where did your passion for climate and sustainability come from? Because you've had such an interesting path from like chemical and biomolecular engineering through to consumer packaged goods and into climate finance. So not the most traditional of paths. Talk, talk me through that journey and, and where that that kind of passion came from sure I, I would say so tackling climate change has always been a personal interest of mine um and then re recently with Grimfoy became also a professional interest which is great to have that alignment um throughout my career I would say I've always been interested in solving problems for my customers uh whether they be businesses or you know people like you and me mm -hmm. um I think it's that, like, if I see it as a puzzle. Um, and I think that comes from the engineering uh, training and mindset that I have, right? It's like, how do we 
uh, build a solution to people's problems. Maybe they don't even know what that solution is, but how can I address people's needs? And I've done that throughout my career, whether it be, you know, cleaning, cleaning agents for, you know, uh, dishwashers for laundry detergent, uh, moving into, um, you know, craft beer and, you know, how people want to, you know, um, enjoy that type of beverage, whether it be alcoholic or non-alcoholic, and then, you know, moving into the space of, of climate. Um, for me, solving climate change and addressing it comes down to also like responsible marketing. So my co-founder, Bonnie, um, you know, she's worked in climate her whole career. Um, and we can talk more about kind of the, how Greenberg came to light, um, you know, in that way. But for me, the responsible marketing piece is really important. Um, I think that, you know, all of us as individuals deserve to be served <laughs> marketing material that's not completely fraudulent. Um, and I saw so much greenwashing, which is essentially like, you know, misleading information about how environmentally friendly, you know, a credit card is or a bank account or, you know, an ETF. Um, and I just think people deserve better um, than being marketed things that are total, total BS. <laughs> this is so calling, calling out greenwashing has been really one of my passions um, that I get to, you know, use at Green Portfolio. Amazing. And, and where did the idea for Green Portfolio come from and and how how did you meet Bonnie and and talk me talk me through the genesis of of the business yeah. yeah so so Bonnie and I met actually probably over 12 years ago we oh. were being eco-conscious back then and reverse uh carpooling together to our job in New Jersey uh so we worked in different divisions um but met then uh mm -hmm. and started thinking about different the entrepreneurial bug got us then and started thinking about different ventures we could start together um, you know, fast forward uh, to 2020, um, Bonnie had already started working on Green Portfolio and received a grant from uh, National Resources Defense Council, the NRDC in the U.S., uh, to start building out a database of climate-friendly financial products. Right. Um, for Bonnie, having worked in, you know, the climate world throughout her career, you know, building out wind farms, you know, for New York State, you know, during the day while her 401k was in fossil fuels at night felt very um, yeah. unfortunate and yeah. and incomprehensible. Um, so it's always been a passion of hers to figure out how she can shift her money into things that are climate aligned. And back in 2020, more and more, um, I'd say retail, like consumer facing financial products were starting to emerge, uh, whether they be uh, cleaner ETFs or climate friendly bank accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, so she saw this shift happening and started keeping track um, and then wanted to build out a database to you know, share that research with others. And what we were, what she was seeing was some were actually green, some were greenwashed. Um, and talking to our very early users, I guess, you know, they're like, we want more of this. How can you, what have you found? And that's when I joined on. Uh, because there's obviously also in climate a communications problem. Like, how do you make this um, accessible, but also like, easy to understand and empowering at a user level? Um, and in the US, you know, talking about things in degrees Celsius or in metric tons or in CO2e, um, it's not really how people want to interact with climate information. <laughs> um, so, despite, you know, us having engineering backgrounds and like being able to talk that lingo, like, most people just want it simplified um, and what's the most impactful metric i mean uh, yeah what what drives it home for people the most and makes it the most related tangible um yeah. so comparing and comparisons right. so comparing to like the s p 500 um has been a useful um indicator on our platform uh starting to incorporate ways of like talking about it in terms of like visualization is useful or like how many flights like mm. is the finance emissions worth or um how many time you know like drives across the country um making sure it's something that's relatable yeah um so we're still using the same type of information i'm still looking at things in metric tons of co2e but we're just not talking about it in that way yeah yeah 
<laughs> Absolutely. And so, so you, Bonnie had already had the idea, started working on it, got the grant when she brought you in to start building it, building out the database and building that out and communicating the message out to people. Yeah. And what did those kind of first few months look like? At what point did you kind of leave the day job to go all in on this? And yeah, and, sure. and turn it into a, a, a full time pursuit? Sure. So um, I would say we, we're we big fans at Green Portfolio of always looking at things when we bring people into the team um, kind of on these like 12 week sprints, right? With like objectives. Uh, and so even though I'd known Bonnie for quite some time, I also signed up for like a 12 week sprint as like potential co-founder and CEO, CMO type role. So we started that, I think it was in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, I... Uh, was working part-time uh, on Green Portfolio during that juncture. Um, and we said, okay, what objective do we need to hit in terms of like jumping in, you know, full-time on this? And, and I this believe- this is summer 2020, right? So this is like mid-pandemic. Correct, mm. correct. Um, it, having, being virtual and remote um, allowed me a bit of flexibility uh, to explore this. Um, and so we said, okay, we need to be able to, you know, validate our customer segment, you know, get a website going, like see some traction, um, you know, what, what early indicators do we need to like continue on? Um, and we started seeing that we launched greenportfolio.com, I believe in March of 2021, we went through, um, a small incubator accelerator, uh, with IBM and Columbia University earlier that year, which I think also gave us the push we needed to really jump into this, you know, full fully. Um, and I'd say that was when we were really full time on it. Uh, didn't look back, bootstrapped, um, started trying to build out this viable business model. And we moved from more of an informational website of vetted products uh, to starting to build out our algorithm for this direct to consumer platform that we've now built today that makes it more personal for an individual to be able to see what, what's going on, what's their baseline with like what their money is currently doing. And then how do you take that and decide what you want to do moving forward from a client perspective? Amazing. And and how has that kind of evolved from a revenue model perspective as, as, as the journey has gone on? Sure. I mean, we've always, our, our mission has always been to get this information into the hands of as many people who want it as possible. Yeah. We have a freemium premium model today. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's free to make an account. It's free to sync up two different bank accounts, you know, for, for yourself. Um, you can get your baseline for free. You can do kind of manual searching for greener alternatives for free. We do though, to like make it more seamless and giving you the greener alternatives, like suggestions, that is like an annual payment. Um, but we try to keep it as, as, affordable as possible. Um, Cause ultimately our goal is then to have um, plugins and data services for financial services providers and financial advisors where the majority of our revenue would come from, right? Um, we, we don't want to be charging um, consumers, you know, for this product. If we don't have to, we do need to keep the lights on though. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. So on the one hand, you're doing this kind of service piece of democratizing this information and and helping people see the impact, but at the same time, kind of turning it into almost well, like a B2B to C marketplace, yeah. essentially, where you would then plug in these financial advisors who can then connect with those yeah. consumers and go, well, now you know your impact. How can I help you to move that? Exactly. We we see what we're doing as just the beginning of like aggregating individual action into this collective pressure uh, and being kind of the collective voice for individuals who really want to be putting the pressure on, um, you know, organizations, asset managers, you name it, right? Um, understanding how that as the money moves, you know, that can be powerful. And in a world where we, you know, the economy isn't in as great a shape as it was a couple of years ago. And, you know, there's a, a cost of living crisis. There are a lot of people struggling to keep the lights on and keep the heating on. Um, how much of an appetite still is there for people to move their money to greener alternatives beyond just focusing on interest rates and, you know, returns? So I would say the interest is still 
pretty high. Um, there is, I'd say, a little bit more scrutiny in terms of financial performance. We do, so we don't, you know, we're not back testing right now, um, but we do provide like the financial performance information for individuals if they want to look at that. Um, it's, it's actually, it's, it's in development right now. So it'll be coming soon onto the platform shortly. Um, but ultimately, you know, millennials like myself, Gen Z as well, like we know that even if, and it's not necessarily proven, there's a you know difference in financial return. We know also that we need a world that's inhabitable in order to like use the money that we're generating and the wealth we're generating um, in the future, and also for you know our children. So there's different intangible factors now, and becoming more and more tangible, honestly, with different climate events. You know that have to be weighed into this equation as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that that you're kind of very much positioning this at millennials and Gen Z for whom I think the trade off between the immediacy of the climate crisis and the returns from your portfolio, the balances, I think our parents generation, perhaps the immediacy of this crisis was still a little bit further down the line. And so the, you know, the returns of their portfolio were kind of outweighing the impact, whereas I think that balance is happily tipping now the other way, right? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. And so two, two to three years into the journey, talk me through what Green Portfolio looks like today in terms of the team and how many users you've got and, and what that growth journey has been for you. Sure. So we're still a very young company, um, but we are growing and it's nice to see the progress and the product out in the world. So um, it's Bonnie and myself. Um, we've also brought on, you know, CTO, a data officer, um, a marketing manager and people to work on this, like exploring this, like, how we scale, right. And how we start bringing this like B2B to C. Um, at this point, we just uh, completed our stealth launch. So it was a private launch of our beta product. Uh, we brought on during that time, I think roughly 160 users uh, through just through our wait list. And I'm really proud to say that, you know, our users, you know, plugged in and there's now over $40 million in financial assets uh, mm -hmm. on our platform that we are assessing for climate impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd say we haven't really been publicly pushing it yet, but our beta is now live and open to the public. Uh, so you'll see more information about that soon too. Amazing. So does that mean that anybody listening today could go on to greenportfolio.com and could use the tool? Yep. Yep. Greenportfolio.com, click get started or sign up, um, create your free account and you're good to go. Amazing. I love that. And and what have your kind of biggest challenges been over, over this past kind of couple of years? And and especially this year, I suppose, how how have you found the market and how has that impacted either positively or negatively what, what you've been doing? Sure. Um, you know, since we were still, you know, we, we didn't launch the product, you know, even in stealth until like the summer, the, mm -hmm. the market conditions didn't affect us, us too much on like the user side of things. And also since we have like the option for the free account, um, we did adjust that. So originally it used to just be like one sync and now we have two to account a bit for that. Um, but that was not really the biggest measure. I think it's always, um, this is gonna be a silly answer, but not knowing what comes next, right? You don't know yeah. what you don't know. Um, yeah. I think being able to pivot quickly is probably the challenge of this year. Um, so looking at the market conditions, you know, back in March, um, when SVB's collapse, mm -hmm. that was a question for us in terms as just as founders of like, okay, well, is this going to change how we fundraise? Is it going to change how we have to think and account for budgeting and runway? Um, it was less about, I think, what our users would want. It was more about how do we make sure that the business, you know, stays, you know, financially viable. And is there anything we need to do on a broader strategic perspective that needed to change? Which is not really a challenge in itself, but it is a challenge when it distracts you from like your day-to-day -day, like business growth, I would say. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think that's been the challenge for a lot of founders this year where the focus has had to be on getting through. Um, and as a result of that, almost held back from all of the brilliant things they could be doing and all of the extra value they could be bringing their customers because they're just 
trying to conserve and get through this period before they can then start to scale and grow. So more a feeling of frustration, I, I suppose, than than anything else. Um, but what are you excited about for next year? Are you able to share any of the plans of what, what the next year has in store? Sure. I mean, look, I'm excited to get the word out that we're live. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're gearing up. We're going to do some of that right now, like approaching December. But that's really our big, exciting goal for beginning of next year is make sure that we're, you know, screaming from the rooftops that, you know, we're live. Individuals can understand their impact, start looking at ways that they can take action with their money. Um we have some features, like I mentioned, the financial information pulling in. Um, we have this wait list, this watch list, drop list feature now that we've just been rolling out. So people, if they don't want to like adjust anything right away or they want to make sure that they have kind of a, a checklist, if you will, of things in their portfolio they might want to remove or things they might want to add, they'll have that ability now on our platform to do that and build out those lists. Um, and we are interested in rolling out ways we can recommend adjacent services. So not necessarily financial products, but things that might cost money, like home electrification, um, understanding like EVs, EV loans, uh, understanding how to take advantage of the IRA as an individual. We have a lot of um, friendly partners in that space that are already doing good work there that we can make sure we're introducing to our users as well. Amazing. So ultimately helping people to address all of the services in their lives that they're spending money on and help them to be greener and more ethical. Yep. Yep. And and fortunately, we don't have to vet all of that ourselves. There's already companies doing that. It's just making sure that we amplify the work of those great organizations. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. So great things in great things in store. Great things planned. Yep. Perfect. And we always round out these episodes with a couple of quick fire questions for your sure. recommendations, if that's okay. So the first sure. one is for a people based resource. So a community or an organization or an accelerator or something that has most helped you along the way so far. So I have found a lot of help from the women in climate community. Um, it's a Slack community, um, but it's global at this point. So there's also, you know, in real life meetups as well in certain cities. Um, but it's really also been great to see that um, Michelle Lee is the founder of that group. Like it started as more just like getting a couple women together for dinners and how it is scaled uh, in its nature of women who maybe aren't working in climate yet, but are interested women who are in climate and looking for just sharing resources, sharing ideas. Um, it's been a really great um, supportive community. Yeah, I, I'm also a member and would absolutely second that. It's so supportive, so collaborative. Um, yeah, just just really kind to people. And they've got that brilliant speaker database as well, haven't they? Um, mm -hmm where any women in the community that want to put themselves forward as a speaker on a particular topic can add themselves to the database. And then any events organizers have got absolutely no reason to say, I couldn't find a female speaker on whatever topic it is. Yeah. <laughs> so helping drive that diversity of, of voices at events. Um, amazing. And the second one uh, being a media-based resource. So books, podcasts, TED Talks, films, documentaries that have been most impactful for you. So I, I have, I, I'll, I'll admit, I have not been keeping up with all my podcasts these days, but one that I have found useful over the years is actually, it's not a climate one, um, but Marketing School with Neil Patel and Eric Sue. It's like five minutes. Um, so it's one that you can just quickly put hop on. There's usually talking about SEO, um, different marketing tactics, which I, as you know, CMO, COO need to keep up on. Um, as the digital world is always changing. So I find that useful. Amazing. And that was called what? Sorry, the marketing. The marketing school. The marketing school. Okay. Amazing. Very, very, very simple. Uh, digital marketing and online tips by Neil Patel and Eric Su. And accessible to everybody, even if you aren't, or we, even if you don't have a good base level in marketing, would you say? Um, I think you need intermediate. Right. Yeah. But I, I'm maybe not, maybe not full beginner. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, and what about a productivity tip or hack? Have you got a great tip, tool, bit of software, anything um, for helping you manage that work-life, founder-life balance? 
That's a good question. No, there is no tool that exists that can balance work and personal, um, in my opinion. <laughs> but but I think I think just understanding that um as as a founder with like also two kids, um, it's not a balance that you're achieving, it's a constant reprioritization. Right. So it's a I would say it's a mindset that is is useful um in terms of understanding what your goals are for your business, um, what you want to be achieving, like with your family, um, or in your personal life and realizing that things can take different priorities on different days. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not necessarily a 50, 50 balance. You have to kind of decide what works for you. Yeah, I think that's it. Cause ultimately there is no such thing as a perfect balance, right? So you're always going to be slightly off kilter one day. Yeah. You can't, you can't try to achieve perfect balance. You'll, you'll drive yourself, um, drive yourself mad <laughs> just accept give into it and go with that flow <laughs> yeah, yeah. a constant constant reshuffling and knowing you know where what your personal and professional values are um I think is kind of what grounds me yeah yeah I listened to a really good I can't, this is going to be very unhelpful now because I'm not going to remember the name of the chap but it was around minimal productivity so rather than having this big to-do list and trying to achieve everything in a day it's always pulling it back to what's my What's my ultimate professional goal and what's my ultimate personal goal? Like what are the most important things in each one of those spheres? And then how close are the things that I'm doing bringing me to those goals? So just always being focused on that. So almost having one to-do item and everything you do driving you towards that yeah. rather than trying to tick off this endless list. It, it all comes down to return on investment, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can think about that for like your business, you can think about it for your, how you prioritize things. Um, but understanding that, you know, time is very valuable, right? And so figuring out how you adjust that is, everyone has their own priority list and own personalization to that. But for me, it's like, what's your return on investment in terms of getting those things done? Yeah, yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing that journey with us and um, with the information about what you're doing at Green Portfolio. It's so important and such important information. I think a lot of people do not realize the impact that their money is having. And so having services like yours that democratize that information, make it accessible to people um, and help people feel empowered to make the right decisions um, is absolutely crucial. So amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody um, for joining us today and for listening, whether you're listening to us live or whether you're listening to us on catch up later on. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again next week, same time with another fantastic US based founder. So please do come back and join us. But for now, have a great rest of the day. And thanks so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Bye.